Hi, everyone. Welcome to Anxiety, Depression, and Suicide Through the Lens of Autism, presented by Autism Virtually, co-hosted by myself, Jen, Mandy, Lisa, and Jeff. Today, we're just going to talk anxiety. Uh, we decided to split this class up into four or five um, smaller sections so that the listener will be able to process the information better separately and not need um, an antidepressant <laughs> afterwards or a box of tissues, as this is a pretty heavy topic. When we started to organize this class, this class is a suicide um, class through the lens of autism, but we realized quickly that um, you can't really talk about <clears throat> the huge um, issue with suicide in our community and not talk about the depression, the anxiety, the trauma. It often leads um, our, our kids, our teens, our adults um, to attempt suicide. So today we'll just be talking anxiety. So my name is Jen. I've been working in the behavioral health field for the past 11 years as a behavioral health therapist or what used to be known as a therapeutic support staff. Uh, my son was diagnosed with autism when he was six and I knew nothing about autism when that happened. Um, it was very scary and overwhelming and I decided, well, I needed to get a job where I could learn a lot about it. So it wasn't too long after that I became uh, a behavioral health uh, work. I work with children with autism and that's a choice. I love that I have access to great uh, behavioral consultants to give me advice with my own son, um, but also that, you know, what I learned from my clients, I've been able to use that information to help um, myself as a parent and vice versa. My son is now 21. He's been suffering from depression and anxiety um, to where it was a disorder, say probably seventh grade on. Um, depression came a little bit later. He attempted suicide twice during high school, once when he was in 11th grade and once when he was in 12th. Um, I didn't see it coming, <laughs> despite that, you know, I do this for a living. I take a ridiculous amount of trainings on autism and everything about it. Um, despite that, I totally missed, missed everything. Um, I wanted to mention that I see a therapist because I want to take the stigma out of that. I've been seeing a therapist for the past three years since COVID hit because COVID is what finally broke me. Um, but I was breaking as most parents of children with autism do for a very long time. And I just kind of accepted that that was part of the journey, right? Turns out not so much. So I am doing much better and I encourage anyone um, with a child with exceptional needs to um, see a therapist weekly and uh, take care of your own mental health. I enjoy diamond painting as a hobby. You can see I have some hanging in here. I end up giving it away as presents, um, but it's very like therapeutic for me. So if you haven't tried it or haven't heard of it, you might want to think about it. Um, it's super fun for me to be able to do something just repetitively and to be able to see like an empty slate turn into a beautiful picture. So as I stated, when we decided to do a suicide training, we realized that couldn't really talk about that in this population without talking about all the precursors. Um, people are onions, not just ogres. Um, we all have layers, um, self-worth, stress, acceptance, trauma, anxiety, depression that lead us down the road um, to good places in our head and, and terrifying places. So as neurotypicals, we're fans of big picture, right? I cannot tell you how many times teachers, um, educators, random people have told me that, you know, my son is great with details, but uh, big pictures, he really struggles. 
So they kind of see that as a problem, right? Um, we are, as neurotypicals, we are big idea people. Um, we're all about generalizations. We're all about seeing the forest, all the forests instead of the individual trees. In fact, we have a saying that says, you know, you can't see the forest or the trees, which means you need to stop focusing on minor things and see the big picture. But when it comes to people, can we ever truly see the entirety that is the forest? And how do we manage the health of this forest if we do not attend to the trees? And we have a child, teenager, adult with autism. It is incredibly important that you become more um, detail oriented in order to keep a, a much better um, pulse of their mental health, how they're doing. Because our kids often, um, whether we have chosen to teach them to mask or we have encouraged them um, at school and through socializations to mask, uh, they often try to make a forest, right? But what we need to do is make sure that there aren't parts of their forests that are getting sick and dying off and, and having trouble because it's with autism always try to pretend that everything's okay. So what is anxiety? According to the American Psychological Association, anxiety is an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes like increased blood pressure. What's really important to understand about anxiety is for people who suffer from anxiety disorders or suffer from a great deal of anxiety in their daily lives, this affects their health in many ways, from lung disease, gastrointestinal diseases, um, cancers, more likely to get, um, aging quicker, lower lifespan. Um, anxiety is a very serious dragon um, that we need to be aware of and do whatever we can to lower um, these feelings in our kids, in our teens, in our adults, so that they can lead healthier lives. So what causes anxiety? Simple answer is stress. Stress is how we react when we feel under pressure or threatened, and usually happens in a situation that we don't feel we can manage or control. So for neurotypicals, we sometimes come into these, um, these situations, right? Like perhaps we're driving to New York and our car dies, right? And we're on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. And that is super stressful. You know what? Like, Someone could come and like kidnap us at any time, really into serial murder podcast. So I've got like imagination of all these terrible things can happen. Um, I try, I have to be somewhere and I'm not going to be there. So I'm feeling under pressure. Um, I can't manage it because I can't fix a car. I have no idea what's, what happened and I can't control it. Um, perhaps also another good example is say we have. Um, an inter job interview, and you really want this job, but we can't control, right, um, if the interviewer decides to hire us or not. We can feel a great deal of pressure because it's well paying, it'd be perfect. Um, you know, you so want this, uh, you need to pay your bills, so you're kind of feeling under the gun there. But it's not something that we can control, so maybe we stay up all night trying to manage um, ways that we're going to, you know, Make them love us and rock that. But when you have autism, the amount of events that cause stress in your life are infinitely greater. Something as simple as going to the store, going to the park, um, getting in the car, taking a walk. Um, so many things they aren't sure they're going to be able to manage. Um, the pressure of the sensory stuff that's going crazy in their brains. Um, it's hard to feel safe when you're going to Walmart and you know it's going to be loud and you're going to have a hard time breathing and it's going to stink. It's just going to be really hard. Um, so for them, so it's Charlie, for them, um, it's a lot more stressors, a lot more events, things that we take for granted um, that cause anxiety in their lives. So depression and anxiety can present in different ways. Um, here's a list of some. Uh, tingling and or numbness in hands and feet, dizziness, fear, sadness, 
muscle tension, cold, sweaty hands, um, nightmares, short of breath, dry mouth, heart palpitations, obsessive, uncontrollable thoughts, avoidance, nightmares, um, other things not listed here, headaches, stomach aches, diarrhea, um, just a bunch of gastrointestinal, heart and lung fun um, things. So what's interesting about this particular infographic is I loved it because of what's on the left and right. And it's important to remember, depressed people hide, and we'll be talking about that in our next uh, time we get together, but anxious people avoid. Parents often ask me why their child is so um, demand avoidant, right? Tell them to do something and they won't do it. Um, so why, why is that? Are they just non-compliant? They just don't want to listen to you trying to be difficult. Um, the truth is, is that when you tell your autistic child, toddler, teen, adult to do something and they don't comply, um, usually that's because of anxiety. If they're avoiding, if a person is avoiding, they're avoiding because they're feeling anxiety. Dr. Monique Bassa, she studies how the stress of being different faced by, is faced by uh, autistic individuals and how that affects um, those who live with autism. And we're gonna listen to her twice, once in this training, and then once um, she talks about depression. She talks about some scary statistics and about um, how she views them. So, I'm going to show you some very scary numbers um, and personally this is where I have a huge problem. So in the non-autistic community up there you can see with anxiety disorders that little red slice and without the anxiety disorders that great big yellow piece. In the autistic community the red is the number of people who suffer from anxiety and the yellow is without. And I suppose you don't need to be Sherlock Holmes to notice the difference. We can play spot the difference, but I'm fairly sure we all get it. Just guessing. That's a huge difference. That's actually kind of shocking. I mean, that's diagnosed anxiety disorder. So we're not talking just general anxiety. We're talking diagnosable within the DSM. And there's lots of people that would like to say that that is just an inherent part of having autism. You're autistic, therefore you're anxious. As if it's part and parcel, as if everything in my DNA that makes me autistic makes me anxious. I think that's a really sad way to look at the world. But I guess that's how they're looking at it right now. And they go, there's a lot of talk in the community about how it is the person with autism, the, the autistic person's fault because they don't fit in, therefore it is their fault when they become anxious. Now, one of the key areas of autism is this um, sensory overload, which means that we can't stop processing information when we should, which means that all the time, I pick up visual cues, um, auditory cues, everything all at once, which means that yes, the world is overwhelming and sometimes I kind of want to put on my noise cancelling headphones and not see anyone ever. I don't do that, of course, otherwise I wouldn't be here. But yeah, you can understand why some anxiety would be attached to that. But can you really blame that? for almost half of the autistic population having diagnosable anxiety. So, as Dr. Bonta said, about 40% of adults, right, um, have diagnosable anxiety if you're on the autism spectrum. But let's talk kids because we're parents, right? We've got children, some of us that are two, three, five, eight, 
15, 16, 20, and then they grow up and then we have adults, um, 28, 35, 40. Uh, we're just gonna talk kids. 40% of children have a clinical diagnosis of an anxiety disorder, which as Dr. Botha told us, um, that means it falls within the DSM. Children, we're not talking 16 year olds. There are children who young as five, six, maybe even younger um, are able to be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. So why is the number so high? As uh, Dr. Botha says, is it because it's just inherent to who they are? I tend not to think that. I think the reason why our children suffer so much from anxiety, yes, we can understand why they will feel anxious, more anxious in a lot more situations, but we don't address what they're feeling is anxiety. When Johnny doesn't listen to me, I don't think this kid's anxious. Um, let me understand where this is coming from and help lower his anxiety. Uh, so when we have uh, a child or a teen or an adult who is not um, doing what we want and who is avoiding it, um, we need to start thinking, okay, this is anxiety and dealing with it as such. Um, why is it hard to sometimes pick out what is anxiety and what is not anxiety? Um, as is said here under spotting sign, your line, anxiety may look different in some children with autism. Signs of anxiety and autism can be difficult to spot because they look similar to the characteristics of autism, right? So some signs include crying, hiding, running away, um, a change in the volume or speed of speech, becoming angry, becoming sensitive to light or noise, non-compliance, mouthing objects and self-harm. They also tell um, you that they try to act normal when they get worried. Um, that's called masking and it's really not good for our kids. Um, so a child gets mad, you can just say, oh, that's just Johnny. You know, Johnny doesn't get what he wants. He gets mad or, you know, um, Johnny's having a really hard time now with the light and the ticking of the clock nearby. Well, that's just autism because, you know, sensory issues. But often we dismiss um, the signs of anxiety and we miss them um, when our kids are younger as just them being autistic. So we really need to start focusing on those trees, parents, um, so that we can figure out when uh, anxiety uh, behaviors start to show so that we can lower our children's anxiety and kind of keep a hat on that. Right? So if you tell your child to do something or if you try to leave your child and they, they start screaming and get really upset, okay? You can see that they're anxious, right? We're gonna recognize that as anxiety now. We gotta stop and think about what we've learned so, okay, why are they feeling anxious? Stress. Again, what is stress? It's how we react when we feel under pressure or threatened. And it happens when we are in situations that we don't feel we can manage or control. So what is it about the situation um, that is causing this reaction? Perhaps um, little Marla uh, feels that she's not going to be safe when you leave and she only feels safe with you. Perhaps that's um, really what's going on. Now we're going to talk about a few factors and how we can help our children manage anxiety so that it doesn't grow into a DSM-5 a monster and they don't grow up to have an anxiety disorder at least do the best we can, right, um, to slow that train down. So biological factor is, of course, as Dr. Botha mentioned, sensory integration problems. I'm not being able to stop attending to an unimportant stimuli. So how do we manage that as parents? Um, number one, we're gonna change the environment for the person. A bedroom for any child needs to be their space and their safe space. So we can really um, up the ante when we have 
um, a child with autism or a teen with autism. So we can paint the walls black. I know most of you are like, oh, that's horrible, but <laughs> it's actually um, sensory rooms, true sensory rooms have black paint. Uh, is calming. We make sure we don't have fluorescent lights that buzz. Uh, we don't want clocks on the wall that even though like it's super cool, shaped like a Pokemon or something that tick, 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 ticks um, constantly in the place that they have to sleep. We can be very aware of changes we can make um, to our environments, not only in their room, but at home. Now, all people who have autism are all different people. They all have different sensory sensitivities. Um, so no two homes and no two plans, no two environments when you're um, setting it up for success for your child are going to look the same. Um, also, when we're talking about environments, we can talk about, you know, what we can do, choices we can make um, to make sure that our children do the best they can outside. Like, for example, I could take Johnny um, to Walmart at 11 o'clock in the morning with me um, when the place is incredibly crowded and it's an overwhelming place anyways but now it's like impossible for him to handle or maybe i could take johnny to walmart like at 7 a.m as soon as they open on wednesday or maybe 9 p.m on a tuesday and i'll tell you if you start thinking about thinking about the environment you're going to be putting your child into and managing the environment instead of managing the child, you're going to find that your life gets infinitely better. You know, um, Johnny, 11 o'clock on Saturday, is melting down, screaming, running away. I can't pick up all the stuff I need. Um, yeah, it's just terrible. I get in the car, I'm crying, just both a mess. But Johnny at Walmart, 7 a.m. or 9 p.m. at night, get everything on the list. He manages better. We get through it without that meltdown. Um, so managing the environment isn't just about changes you make in your home, but it's like how you um, dress the world. You know, when you go out in the world and you think about um, the environment you're putting your autistic child, teen or adult in. You want to give the person tools outside of themselves, like noise canceling headphones, sensory aids. Um, possibly CBD oils. I started using them with my son when he turned 14. I remember walking into the store feeling like I was like buying marijuana or something. It is not like that, but it felt like that. It was doing a drug deal or something. Um, CBD is, has no THC in it, so you're good. Um, but it really changed my son's life the first day I gave it to him and I got the strong stuff because my kid has some severe sensory issues. Um, he came home, I was worried all day. And the first thing he says to me is, you know, mom, the bus was still the bus, but like it didn't bother me today. And so what the CBD oil did for him is it kept his brain from reacting to all the stimuli. Like it normally, you know, would be loud and poof, it just, kind of bogged everything down. It allowed him to attend better at school, focus better, accomplish more. And he would come home, maybe it stopped working around one o'clock. So I'm getting a kid now with only two hours of sensory craziness versus eight. But do be aware, I also know a parent um, who tried it and their son was up for 48 hours straight. So while it may not work for everybody, my own personal experience, um, it totally changed uh, my life and my son's life. He, he did started doing so much better after we started it. He still takes it today, 21. Um, so you want to give um, the person the tools and you start teaching them how to regulate themselves. Like, as you notice, it's getting loud. Okay, I can put my headphones on. Like when you start feeling, being more self-aware of, of how they're feeling because um, this is something that you're not always going to be there for them. You want to teach them self-reliance. Um, you want to give the person the space to allow their um, senses to integrate naturally at a slower pace. And what not to do, uh, three and number one are kind of go together. You do not want to overwhelm them repeatedly so they get desensitized um, and attempt to force their senses to integrate faster. Uh, that is not a thing. All you're doing is... Um, 
basically giving their psychological skin a burn, sunburn. Um, and the next time, if you try to do it, they'll kids, teens, adults probably have a harder time. And they're going to need time to have those synapses in their brain heal and calm down before um, it can start to try to work again. So the best thing you can do for your person with autism is to do what you can to get behind allowing them to integrate more naturally. And do not fault them for not succeeding um, in an environment where their potential to succeed is greatly diminished. You know, schools, colleges, stores, <laughs> um, carnivals, clubs, and so many places out in the world are not made um, in a way that is user-friendly for our kids, teens, adults. And um, especially it's hard with schools, like, you know, Johnny uh, comes home, he did much worse on the test than most of his, uh, most of his peers, but they don't have the sensory issues that Johnny has. They don't have um, the struggles that Johnny has to push through and all what he has to use his mental energy for just to get through the day, much less um, have enough in the tank to really focus on and be able to show what he knows on a test. So make sure that you keep in mind as a parent um, what the environment is like for them. And if they're not succeeding, uh, do not give them a hard time. Um, if that is just not going to be an environment they're going to be able to succeed in. I love this uh, story. Uh, my one client loves penguins. So I wanted to use this a way to think about perspective, right? So it says, if you judge a Gen 2 penguin on its ability to fly in the air, like most other birds, you miss out on its ability to fly through the water at over 20 miles an hour. Sure, a spine-tailed swift can fly at top speeds of 100 miles an hour, and that is under their own power, which is impressive, yes? No diving <laughs> needed. But you know what? They can't swim, and nor is it likely they could fly off global ground either. So if you put a penguin and a spine-tailed swift, who's the fastest bird in the world, on the same level field, a uh, penguin can swim, a uh, spine-tailed swift can't fly. Second factor is a medical factor. Um, people with autism, I said, and it's true, lack the innate knowledge of social cues and norms, and therefore they do not behave in a way that is socially expected. So when our children are diagnosed or our teens, or even if as an adult you're diagnosed with autism, um, you fear that you won't be accepted. Uh, as a parent, you fear bullying is coming. Um, and you want to spare your child pain, right? You don't want them to be ostracized or set apart from the rest of their peers. That's not the kind of life you have imagined for them. You want them to be happy and loved everywhere they go. So how do you manage those fears, those concerns? Um, how do you manage their behavior? So number one, the first tip is, you want to sign your autistic child up for every activity that you can find so they spend more time with normal children and they can learn to emulate them better. You want to teach your child to fake it until they can make it. Secondly, you want to toughen up your autistic child by, for the cruel world, because it is cruel, by encouraging your child to follow all norms, including clothes, encourage only acceptable and popular age-appropriate hobbies so that your child can connect with other kids at their age. And if they cry or complain, remind them that the world won't care if they cry or not. It's your job to help them have the best life. And in order for them to have the best life, they are going to need to conform. Now, when I read these uh, two tips to a live audience, I swear, I thought people were going to pass out. This one um, wonderful young lady, she's 17, she has autism, was horrified, <laughs> absolutely horrified. Didn't pick up on the social cues that uh, sarcasm, right? <laughs> uh, it, it really got quite the 
quite the reaction from the group. And, and you probably should also be like thinking, oh my gosh, this is horrible, right? But that's what we do, isn't it? We find our child has autism. Like for example, I sign my son up for every social event because I learned autism is a social disorder. So I figured by signing him up for every sport, every possible thing I could, he would that would help him catch up socially, right? Um, he hated most of the things I signed up for. He had no time to do what he loved. Um, he did not uh, catch up. He did, I think probably it stunted him a little bit more because he wasn't around kids who were into the things he was into and he wasn't interested in socializing with them at all. So I actually ended up kind of doing the opposite of what I intended to do with him. Um, often I'll hear parents say, well, you know, the cruel, the world isn't going to care. You know, it's a cruel world out there. We have to get them ready for the world. But at what cost? You know, maybe we need to be focusing on getting the world ready for them uh, versus the way we do it. And we don't do it out of, out of unkindness. We do it what we think is misguided love. We do that with misguided love. Um, so what not to do? Do not attempt to manage your child's differences. You know, when people don't understand your way of thinking, they'll either befriend you, fear you, or attempt to destroy your character or all three. I thought what I was doing was befriending my child, but I was actually stunting him because I was making him go to all these things he didn't care about instead of putting you know, time into what he was passionate about and what made him happy because of the fear I had what it was going to be like, um, you know, socially, the difficulties he would have. This is so deep and so right. Scott Barry Kaufman, incredibly sage man. These six words can save your child so much unnecessary pain. I love you as you are. We need to accept our children for who they are. Research shows that children, although they may not show the signs for autism until they're like 18 months old or two, are actually born with autism. And it's showing that brain scans um, for newborns and, and babies up to a couple of weeks old, you can see um, through the scans whether they have autism or not. Autism is not some thief in the night. It's not that you had this one child and then autism came and took away your idea of what your child would be. This is what your child was always going to be, you know, and we need to love them and accept them for that, for who they innately are. Everyone deserves that kind of love. Um, mental health factor. So, Autistic children and adults struggle with feeling as if they are in control and control and problem solve on their own. So instead they avoid and what they fear and that they will not be able to do. So how do you manage um, that fear of the unknown in your child, your teen, your adult? So first things first, when your child or autistic adult box initially at a directive or task, keep in mind it is likely their anxiety that is causing that reaction, okay? So don't go to non-compliant, defiant, um, just doesn't want to listen, right? Um, see what's really going on so that you can address what's really going on. So you want to treat their the reaction with their anxiety in mind. Um, break something into smaller tasks. Teach them more about what the task involves. Um, give them extra time to process the request and build up the self-belief to do it. You know, this is something I deal with as a parent. Um, I'm using the word Johnny, my favorite, like, pretend child boy's name. But let's say I tell Johnny to take the trash. My guy, this is, like, real. And, um, 10 minutes later, Johnny hasn't taken out the trash. So I feel I've been patient enough. But actually, you know what? Johnny needs 12 minutes um, to process and to work up to actually taking out the trash. At 10 minutes, I'm like, Johnny, calm down and take out the trash. Well, and I reset that 12 minutes. And now it's like 20 minutes. Trash is still not taken out. 
Um, I'm only hurting myself in the foot because if I had been quiet, trash would have been out the door eight minutes ago. Um, do I continue to yell at Johnny? And if I do, well, then there's that time where this starts again. I used to think that my son kind of like would do that as, well, if you're going to yell at me, I'm restarting my timer. But it's not a conscious choice. It's it's not something that they choose. It's something that they need. And each person is different. Each person's individual timer is different. And depending on the task, you know, 12 minutes to take out the trash. Uh, hey, buddy, get a shower. You're looking at like an hour and a half there um, to get that one done because of the sensory issues my kiddo had. Um, so it's important to keep that kind of stuff in mind too. Um, you want to create successful experiences to raise their self-worth and love. Um, if someone, if someone's child says, hey, I can't do this, then do it with them. Show them that they can, you know. Um, go out and do things like hikes, hike up a mountain, you know, maybe that's anxiety inducing because Johnny doesn't think that Johnny can do it, but you say, hey, I'm right here with you. We'll do it together. And then Johnny does it and feels like this great feeling of accomplishment. We want our kids to feel accomplishment and that they can do things, even if it worries them. And you will, in time, um, help them be a lot more courageous when you aren't there to help them through things. Um, you want to share them what they are passionate about and use what they love to build up their own self-love and self-belief. For example, Thomas the Tank, uh, there's, ooh, fun fact for any of you watching this, tomorrow, Bruno is going to um, be the new train. He is autistic, so that's pretty cool, right? Um, an autistic character and an autistic voice actor is pretty awesome. But let's say uh, your, your son or daughter is really into Thomas the train, as many of our kids are. You say, you know, do you remember when Thomas uh, wasn't sure he could make it up that hill himself, you know, but he he knew he had other friends who could help him if he needed it. And he knew it, it would be important for him to do. So he he took up his bravery and he went up that hill and he made it. Do you remember that? That's just going to be just like what you're going to do. You're going to go over that hill just like Thomas. If you can take preferred interests, passions, and connect them to their own self-esteem and to make it meaningful to them, you will have a much better success rate. Always use um, areas of passion to help our children grow. What not to do? Um, do not try to force them to follow a direction or do a task by giving punishments or negative consequences if they do not comply. If this is an anxiety-driven behavior, as most are, um, you're just going to make it worse, uh, like I did with the trash, right? It's like 40 minutes later, the trash isn't out, so I'm like, take it out myself. Um, but if I'd been quiet, like it would have been out 28 minutes ago. Um, you got to make sure that if you think it's anxiety-driven, um, I'm telling you right now, punishments, negative consequences do not work. Um, with these behaviors. It's important for our kids to feel um, good about themselves. Fun fact, I actually uh, was reading through this sign to the left with my son, and he's 21. He is an Eagle Scout. He um, is a senior in college right now. He's a physics major, and he has a minor in East Asian studies and uh, geology, right? So he's accomplished a lot in his life. He's worked really hard to get to where he is. So you would think that he, that would mean he has a, a good self-esteem, right? I've been working on it for years. I was interested to see what he would um, say, true, false, right? I am enough, I guess. Um, I accept myself mostly. Um, I trust myself. Eh. Well, I don't know what that means. I guess not. But even with someone who's accomplished as much as he has, um, building that self-esteem, that self-worth, that self-belief is incredibly hard because he goes out into a world where he doesn't get the understanding and the extra help he needs to um, to reach his potential. And when he doesn't receive that, he doesn't um, do as well as he could. People don't understand. They think that's just as well as he can do, you know, like that's um, the best he has. And it's 
often not the case. If your child, teen, adult says, I can't do something, uh, turn can't into can. Talk to them about why, why can't you do it? What is it about this task or, or this thing I'm asking you to do or mommy going um, to work without you? Why can't you, why can't you handle this? Our kids, teens and adults, are very much in touch with themselves and they may be able to you know, tell you what it is about um, what's happening that makes them feel uncomfortable. And also remember, like I said, if they feel they can't do it by themselves the first time, uh, do it with them, help them succeed. They will succeed then when uh, without you, right? So that is uh, anxiety the lens of autism training. Thank you so much for sticking with me and listening to uh, this training. I hope that you have learned um, some things you did not know. We'll be talking more about the physical effects of anxiety when we have um, So thank you again so much. If you have any questions, please um, put them at the bottom in the comment section and we will make sure we come back and answer them. Thank you so much for your time and have a great day.